These robots are making thousands of terabytes of RAM, and we learned the secrets of RAM manufacturing that no one else knew until now. V-Color's Taiwan-based factory pumps out memory using custom-built automation to bin the best overclocking chips for high-end memory. In this special addition to our factory tour series, we'll watch as SMT lines manufacture memory sticks for multiple large memory brands. We'll see hundreds of testing stations scattered around the entire office building, working around the clock to stability test RAM. And we'll meet this guy, the symbolic manta of V-Color. I'll call him Gary. We'll start our tour of V-Color here, in its automated overclock binning lab. There's no buzzword usage of AI here. These are just straight up robots and automation, the old school way, except with ultra advanced frequency and stability testing of the modules. Meet the backbone of this operation. These robots come in yellow and red variations, with each serving a special purpose. Naturally, the red robots are faster, just like how red LEDs make your computer faster. Both types set to work quality checking memory as soon as it enters the factory from the supplier. The supply gets dropped off here. The factory itself is extremely low key. It's located in Xindian, Taiwan, and it's hidden away upstairs in this older mixed use office and residential building. The hallways leading to the advanced, ultra clean, bright facilities we see in this video are deceptively dark to the extent that we thought we were in the wrong place when we first arrived. But just upstairs is this advanced overclocking test lab. This lab features high-speed binning robots and automation to determine the chip quality of each individual module that V-Color buys from suppliers. Memory suppliers mostly include SK Hynix, Samsung, or Micron. They can process DDR4 or DDR5 memory in these lines, and they perform simple pass-fail analysis. That analysis is done at a given frequency. Those that pass progress to burn-in testing on a per-module basis for stability, while those that fail are sent back to other robots for testing at lower frequencies. Only two operators are required to keep this entire binning facility running, and because this lab is kept running with so few people, the natural ambient noise is just the pneumatics of the robots. That's the physical mechanics of binning memory, but there's a whole software side to it. The automation is able to run 24-7. The screens outside of this lab show the different bins that V-Color was testing at the time we visited. The large number at the bottom is the yield, or the pass rate, at that particular spec. A few of these are at 100%, which is impressive, and we were told that certain die types, like SK Hynix A die, can be more predictable for the target frequencies. If you look closely, there's one here that's at a 57.52% yield, which is very low. That doesn't necessarily mean the chips are defective, just that they can't hit these settings. That particular test appears to be configured at 1.18 volts and using timings of 17, 19, 19, 39. That 2,183 number you're seeing is the quantity of chips to test with these settings. Other frequencies at the time we visited included 6,400, 6,200, 4,400, and 7,200 plus, but we'll look at that later. But before we move on to burn-in testing, let's talk about how these robots actually do the binning. The test is simple. This robot moves into position over the loading tray of fresh memory from the supplier. It then lowers and uses eight suction cups to pick up the individual chips. It then moves them into a prep board for a couple of seconds and then into the testing platform. The actual test typically takes about 15 to 20 seconds, but it requires a lot of time to move that arm physically around. The robotic arm then picks the chips back up after that 15 to 20 second period and it moves over to either a pass or a fail tray. This particular test we're watching, including the time it takes the robot to move the arm between trays, took about 50 seconds per eight chips. At 24 seven operation, assuming zero interruptions, that would mean this machine could perfectly complete over 1700 tests per day, which would be almost 14,000 samples per day for this one machine. 
The red machines operate much faster and have more complex movements so that the arm can maneuver around the chamber quicker. Its main advantage is that it has more testing trays though. So instead of waiting for the test to complete before picking up the chips, it can alternate between two groups of eight units. If you look closely when it's placing the units down in the pre-test tray, you'll see two locations for those chips to rest. It also has two locations for active testing. This particular test was completing about 16 modules per minute, so at that pace it could do around 23,000 per day without interruption. The yellow machines were the prototypes. They can run for an hour at a time completely unmanned, at which point an operator has to load and check them. The new red machines can operate for 24 hours after loading, so this factory may be able to go slimmer on staff for the night shift. We learned that they can test up to four timings, alongside voltage and frequency tests, to expedite the process. We asked what the error rate is of the machine itself, and we were told, confidently, 0%. It never makes an error. That's impressive. Other machines in this lab include a few things we couldn't show, and then an oven, which is a classic for a testing facility. This is also useful for NAND testing, because B-Color can manufacture RAM or SSD, which is a common mix for these two components. The oven tests products at 98 degrees Celsius for endurance and stability. After all this automated testing, the memory goes down a quick trip down the hallway to the SMT machines, or the surface mount technology line. And this is where the robots really pick up. Molten solder, lasers, and precision. These lines make everything in the PC industry. This is the V-Color SMT room. Here, it operates two full-length lines for manufacturing memory. These lines consist of solder paste machines, pick and place machines, and machines that cut the memory PCB. Because they're making RAM, it's small and efficient, and can largely be run with a single operator in the room. Service mount technology lines are used for almost every component at some point in the production process for PCs and they've never stopped being cool. <laughs> SMT lines are always exciting. They feature ingots of solder that turn into a molten mixture to apply board wide. They also have fast paced robotic arms that place components with deadly precision. And the only human intervention is to keep a constant feed of reels upon reels of components and bars of solder. There's solder paste and masking, there are pick and place machines, there's baking processes with ovens, automatic optical inspection, and PCB cutting. Some lines, like MSI's, have extra steps for photography of motherboards or GPUs to check against customer RMAs in the future. The longest SMT line we've ever seen is about 100 meters long, and it was fully automated. But back to V-Color's line, it's smaller than VGA and motherboard lines by comparison. It doesn't need the same complexity. That, however, is an advantage for efficiency. The first step of the SMT process is to load the solder mask and the blank memory PCBs. The RAM goes through a machine that applies a thick paste to the board. This prepares the memory stick to get baked later, which solidifies the components to the PCB. Next, a conveyor belt takes the stick away. The blue blocks represent where the batches are. You can see that it's moving from right to left. The bottom right gives away the speed. This belt is moving currently at 82 centimeters per minute, although they slowed it down for us to film. You can see that the assembly time is 38.68 seconds per board, which is impressively fast. Currently, the line is processing 3,529 chips per hour and 70 boards per hour, averaging about 50 components per board. And remember, that's everything. Each part on these reels, each part getting placed by these robots, it's all counted here. It's not just memory. Meanwhile, complex parts like motherboards can be thousands of parts per board. After going through the solder paste application, the RAM progresses to a machine that performs automatic optical inspection and begins the pick and place process. In this shot, we can see the memory chips themselves getting placed on the PCB by the robotic arm. Before and after each movement, it's optically scanning to ensure accurate placement prior to baking. We also have a few shots where they paused the line for us so that we could see the interior of these machines. That's also when we did what we do best in these tours. Get in the way and get yelled at by robots. Okay. 
The hottest oven is the first one, meant to apply the solder paste for use. That one runs at 260 degrees Celsius. The last oven is the coolest of them, as the more sensitive components have been placed by this point. At the end, the memory is spat out five complete sticks at a time, consisting of all components and ready for separation. Compared to all these precision robots, PCB separation is a relatively barbaric process, mostly involving a saw. You can see as this technician loads the custom-made holsters for the five packs of memory, he gets the honors of pressing the giant green button. We tell him it's go time. And you can hear the saw precisely separating the components and cutting the excess PCB off. The technician removes the excess circuit board pieces. All of the PCB powder is vacuumed out during the process and contained in a sealed container to be disposed of. Thus far, each stage of this operation has been impressively efficient, with only a few people needed in environments that, compared to some of the steel factories and chemical factories we've been in, are on the nicer side. But there's one more stage to the process of memory manufacturing, and that's burning. This is the Burnin' Lab, and here, V-Color tests every single stick of memory that it makes. This one room contains over 200 available test beds for memory. At a surface level, these are just test benches. They consist of a normal motherboard, a CPU, and a cooler. But on closer inspection, the memory is socketed into special risers, functioning as interposers that are used for validation and burn-in. Every stick that's 8 gigabytes and under goes through a one-hour burn-in test, with each stick exceeding 8 gigabytes requiring one and a half hours for burn-in. The screens light up green for all the good modules and will flash errors for anything that fails the test. For the most part, bad chips would have been weeded out in the first stage of the bidding process, but it's possible that entire DIMM sticks fail due to manufacturing issues in the SMT process. This station identifies those. In the event of a failure, the bad stick is taken for diagnostics by a technician. There are various ways to try and recover a bad stick. One would be desoldering and resoldering any components that might be misaligned. This can be done manually, although that would normally be caught by AOI in the SMT line. Failures can get through SMT. Another recovery method is reflow ovens, where they can send the stick back through a local oven just to reseat and reflow the solder. A final option might be determining that the stick is unsalvageable, such as with a bad PCB, and so V-Color would have technicians remove the valuable DRAM for reuse on a new stick. It goes all the way back through the process. This reduces waste, reduces cost, and makes sure that they can make use out of the parts that are actually still good. The last station has the coolest job in the building. Overclocking. And something here caught our eye. This station mixes manual and automated processes. Technicians possess memory overclocking and tuning abilities in addition to their normal work requirements. Ultra high bin SKUs go through this specialized room, contributing to some of the cost for those bins, and the resulting sticks might be distributed to extreme overclockers, competitive overclockers, or just sold as a special line. There's a big hands-on investment for these SKUs that are 7,000 plus. You'll notice that they keep memory cooling mounted to these stations as well. V-Color says that its a die units perform best at 60 degrees Celsius and below, with m die at its best at 80 degrees Celsius and below. As the memory modules exit these test rigs, they're sent to automatic packaging and shipped to retailers and OEM customers. Memory is one of the most space-efficient manufacturing processes in the entire industry. And it's all packed in tight. The SMT lines are literal steps away from the automated binning and burn-in testing. That means any failures or reworks can be taken care of on the day that they're found, which keeps the process efficient and the throughput high. And that is the start to finish of how memory is made. The biggest unshown step in this process is the actual silicon fabrication supply side, but maybe that can be a future tour with SK Inix or someone. We have a ton more videos coming up in this series and we're publishing a new installment every single Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time or GMT-5. 
To catch the next one, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icon on the channel page. YouTube has multiple levels of subscription these days, and most people don't realize that, so make sure you go and tick the box. You can also support these efforts by visiting store.gamersnexus.net to grab a soldering and project mat, a mod mat for PC building, or a GN15 metal emblem glass to help fund our next trip. We don't take sponsorships for these tours directly from the companies we're visiting, so they're entirely self-funded for travel and hotels, and that means they're audience funded. Check back next week for the next installment in the series and hit the playlist link below to find everything so far. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.